Good evening. I'm Dana Johnson, Chair of the English Department, and I'm so pleased to welcome you tonight to the Shabir and Malini Chowdhury Foundation Distinguished Speaker Series. Through their foundation, the Chowderies have brought to USC both their significant Chowdhury Prize in Literature and this remarkable evening tonight, a conversation with literary treasure, Maxine Hong Kingston. Yes. For the last four years, the Chowdhury Foundation has collaborated with USC to present important writers such as Michael Adanche, Zadie Smith, Natasha Trethewey, and Maxine Hong Kingston. On behalf of the university and the English department, please join me in appreciating Shubir and Melina Chowdhury's vision for this series and in thanking them for their generosity. Okay. I'd first like to introduce my incredible colleague, David Eulen, who will be in conversation with Maxine Hong Kingston tonight. He is the author and or editor of many books, including Sidewalking, Coming to Terms with Los Angeles, the former book editor and book critic of the Los Angeles Times. He has written for the Atlantic Monthly, Harper's, the Paris Review, and the New York Times, among others. He has also received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the Lannan Foundation. For Library of America, he has edited Didion, the 1960s and 70s, and Didion, the 1980s and 90s. His novel, 13 Question Method, was published in October. And with David tonight, we have the privilege to be in the same room with one of the most important writers of our lifetime. Yeah. And that is the one and only Maxine Hong Kingston. Yes. Since her first book, The Woman Warrior, was published in 1976, Hong Kingston has reoriented the ways in which we perceive ourselves as immigrants, as women, as Americans of various ethnic identities. Her work compels readers to not only question the pernicious notion of identity, but to reject such notions outright and her influence on Asian American literature and Asian American studies is boundless. The author of more than 13 books of fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and essays, Hong Kingston is the recipient of an American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature, the Pulitzer, the National Humanities Medal, the National Book Award, and the National Book Critics Circle Award. In 1922, the Library of America collected her seminal works, The Woman Warrior, Chinaman, Tripmaster Monkey, and other writings. Born in Stockton, California, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hong Kingston is Professor Emerita at the University of California, Berkeley. Please, please join me in welcoming her and David Yulin. Thank you for that warm, warm welcome. So you're just going to be a wonderful group of listeners for me to experiment on. So the experiment I want to try is to read to you from my diary. And uh, this is something that I wrote for myself and it's private, and, but I, I, I'll read it to you and just see how it goes over. Um, this is about a time when a, uh, a group of us, uh, mostly writers and artists, uh, went down to the border 
uh, and um, we, our idea was to witness what was happening there. So the f first uh, place that we stopped was um, at the court in Tucson. We came to an immense new building, not quite brutalist architecture, airier. It was built especially for processing immigrants. We're going to witness a ju judicial proceeding called streamlining. Watch 70 immigrants be deported in 90 minutes. We waited and waited in the hallways. The spectator seats are full. We ha we'll have to take turns, but nobody was exiting. Let's go down to floor two. Maybe we can watch initial processing. A guard said, a lot of bleeding hearts here today. Waited and waited on floor two. There was a lit up board like at the airport with names of people and their attorneys and judges. Some lines labeled flip-flop. Nobody could tell me what flip-flop means. Went back up to floor six. I entered and took a seat in back. A row of about 10 men shuffled in. They were shackled hands and feet, earbuds for hearing translators, mostly short men, brown skin, black hair. A Latino man seated on the outside of the railing turned around and looked at us, looked at me. I nodded and looked away, but caught his nod back. Three behind the shackled men, three or four lawyers, maybe public defenders, would remove an earbud and talk privately into a man's ear. The judge, a pretty Caucasian blonde woman, asked a series of questions. All of the, the accused must answer yes to all of the questions. Yes is the correct answer. The court recommends yes. I remember three of the questions. Are you an alien? Alien to the United States of America? C, yes. C, C, yes. 10 C's and yeses. For detention of 105 days, with credit for time served, do you agree to waive the right to a trial by jury? Yes, C, etc. Has no one forced you to plead guilty or made any promises to you other than what we've talked about here in this court? C, yes, etc. My naivete is bottomless. I'm aghast that rights are like gaming chips. You're given so many chips, time, credits, jury trial, and you could trade them. And you swear that you were not coerced or pressured to play by these rules. The group of shackled men shuffled out, and a new group shuffled in. But this time, there was a difference. A man answered no, no to waiving trial by jury. The judge asked him the question again and asked if he understood it. A lawyer took out the man's earbud and spoke to him, told him the consequences of no. The judge was giving him a chance to change his mind. He said again, no. The court finished the streamlining. Shuffling out of the courtroom, many of the men kept their heads turned toward us spectators. I felt their eyes saying, help. 
Next, we went to an amphitheater like room, like a lecture hall, a classroom. A judge spoke from a table in front. Like every public official we met, he commended the state's treatment of illegal immigrants as humane. Operation Streamline is as humane as possible. Out of 1,000 people caught at the border, only 70 are put on trial and imprisoned. The rest are turned back. People with children are turned back. Those arrested are seen by the Mexican consulate and given advice. The judge was very tired, a large, heavy, coughing man. He held what looked like a plastic, unlit cigarette that he'd put in his mouth and take out again. His other hand opened a matchbook, but he did not light it. Earl said, he's going to die soon. Jessica Hagedorn said, he's Shakespearean. He's tragic. I like him. The judge suffered our group's questioning of him. One of the radical Latino guys asked whether the judge, a Mexican-American, was going against himself, betraying yourself and his own people. The judge gave his story, beginning with his grandfather's immigration. His family was fortunate. Grandparents, parents himself, all fortunate. His grandfather fortunate to have come when the crossing was easier. The family made money. All crossing was easier. They got educations, served in wars. He himself in Vietnam, he'd been a public defender. Not Mexican-American, he said. Not this American, that American, but American. He heaved himself up from weariness to the eloquence of the orating trial lawyer, barely coughing. One of us observed that one of the streamlined men had grass in his hair. Are they disoriented and wounding and wounded coming out of the desert into court? The judge said, I can't criticize a man's grooming habits, but they do come straight from the desert to the courtroom. They are checked, oh, they do not come straight from the desert to the courtroom. They are checked medically. They get fed. They get water, a place to sleep. Their consulate speaks to them. The lawyers speak to them. There are translators at least two days of preparation before they come into the courtroom. Jessica Hagedorn asked after the man who pleaded no, what's going to happen to him? The judge said, he's basically screwed. He screwed himself. He could have gotten away with 105 days in detention camp. Now he's going to get two to five years. The judge said, there's no way he will be found innocent. A, a judge said that. The judge prejudged. He already knows the man is guilty. He will get two to five. Patiently educating us, he reviewed the process. The Border Patrol picks up a group of immigrants and sorts them out. You with the kids, you go back. You who've been seen entering the country without documents, you go to court. At court, you're offered a plea bargain. You can plead guilty to a misdemeanor, a small thing, not having papers. That man who pleaded no will be charged with a felony. Illegal immigration. No way will he be found innocent. The Border Patrol witnessed him committing that crime. 
He broke the law the moment he stepped across the border. Crime migration, say the activists who, who made up that word for criminalizing the attempt to cross the border. Then the judge started speaking and it just sounded more personal. How open and free and efficient the crossing is when we want something. We transport wild turkeys and gray wolves and money and money and tomatoes, vegetables. His cigarette hand moved back and forth, indicating many things and creatures passing back and forth. But we can't find a way to transport people. We want gray wolves, we transport gray wolves. We can't transport people. So uh, we went on and uh, we uh, uh, went across the border back and forth at Sasibo and Nogales and, uh, and, and we went to refugios. Uh, some people went to the morgue, but I didn't want to do that. I didn't think I could take it. Um, and uh, what we brought, uh, we brought our witnesses, witnessing, and everybody was political. And, uh, but I, I f felt that there was another level to this, especially since I'm writing a diary. I, I, um, I can write down uh, things that are supernatural or superstitious. And uh, so I, uh, so I heard about this. Making the crossing, hundreds of migrants have had to, have had to, well, okay, this first draft, okay. Try it again. <laughs> Making the crossing, hundreds of migrants have had appear to them a man who brings water and food and sometimes money. Lately, he's been known to drive a pickup truck and give rides. He points out the direction the immigrants should continue traveling and where to find shelter and even a job. When you've made good in El Norte, he tells them, come back south and give th thanks at Santa Ana de Guadalupe in Jalisco. People who've completed that pilgrimage were surprised to find a picture of that very man they'd met in the desert. He's Father Toribio Romo, shot to death in the Cristero War, 1928. On the, back of, on the back of holy cards, there's a prayer. Uh, it's a pl pl prayer for migrants. It's from the point of view of the people left behind. We ask through the intercession of Santo Toribio Romo for the caring and protecting of our family who have had to leave the house. Protect them from all evil and that they remain firm in faith so they can soon return to our home, strengthened in the soul and body. So I brought to, um, to the border uh, holy cards of Father Toribio Romo, and I brought medals, and I found at the CVS store holy candles for, uh, for Saint Romo, and I brought those, and, uh, and I distributed the, them um, at the border and on the other side, and uh, it's, and I felt that uh, 
I, I wasn't just bringing uh, like water or food or shoes. Shoes are what uh, they have at the refugios. Um, I, you know, it, I, I didn't want to just look at this as a political uh, story or, or, or event. It's also a spiritual journey. And, uh, and so I, I am wearing a um, St. Terribio Romo medal right now because um, uh, there's talk going around that, uh, that birthright citizenship will also be denied. And uh, so that would include me. And so I'm wearing my medal just to see whether we can um, stop that. Uh, oh, on, on this trip, I also met a woman whose name is Dream. And that goes with the, the dream, uh, the dreamers' uh, rights. Um, now I'm going to read to you a, um, an immigration um, that is legal. And, uh, and it's also about memories of, uh, of my mother when she uh, came to America illegally. And, uh, and it's also about me, but I'm just a tourist in this. Once I was on an airplane beside a village girl in the window seat. At takeoff, I asked her, where are you going? Wah, she shouted in surprise and grabbed a hold of my hand. You speak like me. Yes, I speak Sayup language. Are you from the village? No, my mama and papa came from Sayup villages. They left for New York. They lived in New York, then California. I was born in California. I feel like a child, younger than this girl. I'm telling about parents as if I still had them. I'm talking in my baby language. Wah, she exclaimed loud as though yelling across fields. I am going to New York. I am meeting my husband in New York. He's waiting for me in New York. He works in a restaurant. He's rented a home. He sent for me and waits for me. She did not, not let go of my hand. I held hers tightly as we flew the night sky. She looked in wonder at webs of lights below. Red, red, green, green, she said. Red, red, green, green, my mother used to say, meaning, oh, how pretty. The lights were white and yellow, too, and gold, blue, copper, and above, stars and stars. Mother, mama, as you leave the village family, you'll never see again. Grandfather walked her as far as he could walk, stood weeping in the road until she could not see him anymore when she turned around to look. She's off to that lonely country from where, from where he returned broke. I felt that I was dying. Mama, girl, you are not traveling alone. I am traveling with you here, holding your hand. I know that country you're leaving for and shall guide you there. I know your future. I'm your child from the future. Your husband will certainly meet you. Baba will be at the East Broadway station. You will recognize each other though he be dressed Western style. You will have a good, good life. You will have many children and live a long, long life. You will be lucky. You are lucky. 
Now I'm talking to the girl. You are lucky. Your husband has work. He's rented an apartment and made you a home. He saves money. He bought your plane ticket. He will be waiting for you at the airport. She listened to the wise old woman teaching her, but how to instruct anyone the way to make an American life, how to have a happy marriage. For a long time in the dark, dozing, dreaming, thinking, we sat without speaking, without letting go of warm hands. The red, red, green, green appeared again. I told her, that's Japan. We're over Japan now. We'll be landing soon in Narita. Wow, you speak Japanese too. She admires me too much. Inside the horrible confusion of the international airport, how can a mind from the village not fall to crazy pieces? I found a nice American couple making the connecting flight to New York and asked them please to take this Chinese girl to the right gate. She thanked me. She said goodbye. See you again, Joy Kin. She did not look back. Good. Gotta go. Things to do. People to meet. Places to be. Last, I'm going to read to you a, um, a treaty. And uh, this treaty was made for, um, for a freedom that we didn't, that we don't hear about anymore, that I have not seen in any constitution. Uh, it is a treaty for the freedom of travel. And this treaty was made between China and the U.S. The United States of America and the Emperor of China cordially recognize the inherent and inalienable right of man to change his home and allegiance and also the mutual advantage of the free migration and immigration of their citizens and subjects respectively from the one country to the other for the purposes of curiosity, of trade, or as permanent residents. This is Article 5 of the Burlingame Treaty signed in Washington, D.C., July 28, 1868, and in Peking, November 23, 1869. Okay, there's a broken treaty for you, huh? And I just love that one phrase where we could be free to travel for the purpose of curiosity. I mean, just that. And, uh, and we don't have this anymore. Okay, so this, um, so this, I, I've printed it out in China Men, so we, can, we all have copies of this uh, treaty. You have it right there. And so my idea is when we get to borders, can we just show this when they ask for our passport? We just show them this, okay? And, uh, and then I, I recommend that you also have your passport. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you for listening for, the, for this unpublished stuff and for this hard stuff. And, um, and let's, let's, let's. Let's all be in the spirit of Father Toribio Romo.
Thank you, Maxine. That was lovely. Um, hi, everybody. I'm David Eulen. Um, and I'm just going to get my notes out here so I can <clears throat> be cogent. I want to start, because you read from a diary and you also read from published work, I want to start by asking you about public and private writing. Um, you know, there, in, in um, I like a, a broad margin to my life, which you read from, you talk about the idea that, or you have talked about the idea that that began almost as a diary and then it became something else, that there was a, um, a place where you had to wait to see if you would kind of get out of the mundane daily life of the diary and into something else. And so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about the nature of diary writing and writing for oneself um, because the writing, your, your public writing is also quite intimate, but intimate in a, in a different way. So can you talk a little bit about the difference between public and private writing? I think all of my writing starts pr privately in that uh, I will express uh, feelings and ideas and visions that I have that uh, and, and secrets, and I just mean to put them into words, and I, I do not think about publishing them. Um, and, uh, and, but then there, but there has come times when I have thought, this is so good, this is, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just got to show this to people. And, uh, and, and then some work, but then I would, to, sh to make it presentable, I, I need to uh, uh, make it uh, uh, more beautiful. I have to polish it and, and, and make it uh, understood so that uh, what I would want is, for the reader to, to get the same feelings or have the same vision that I have. And uh, to, to do that in words is, uh, uh, it, it, it takes a, a technical skill. And, but, but I have also, um, when I started teaching writing, uh, I all, all all of a sudden I understood that there's such a thing as uh, private writing and there's public writing and when you come to a class and you write and all right away it's public writing because you're going to show it to the, your teacher and you're going to read it to the rest of the class and um, and and in these writing classes. I know that students have, uh, everybody has started writing a diary at some time, and I would tell them, don't do diary writing in this class. That doesn't count. Um, and so that is, that's something I would tell the students, but then it, it, the, the border is not so strict in, in my writing. Well, it's, it, I mean, it's interesting because the writing, your, your public writing is deeply intimate and, you know, revealing both yourself, certainly yourself, and also family and, and I mean, certainly the nonfiction. We can talk a little bit about Trip, uh, uh, Trip Master Monkey in a bit, but uh, so how does that transition get made? If you're starting initially as a, as a private writer, I mean, beyond just the idea that it's good, there's got to be a kind of... Um, contextual shift, right? Because you're, you're, not, you're no longer writing just for yourself. You're, you're aware of writing for an audience. How does that change the work for you? How does that change the process of the writing? Well, I have tried to tell myself that uh, there is nobody breathing over my shoulder and I'm not going to get Publish. I'm not going to publish this. I tell myself that right. in order to be able to be more honest mm -hmm. and and uh, to uh, say things that 
are not attractive. Uh, I, I, the, so so it, it's, it's some very contradictory things that we're working on. On the one hand, uh, okay, let the ugly uh, feelings come out. Let out that anger. Uh, and, uh, uh, but you, the words have to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so how do you do that? Uh, so it's, it's, it's always a struggle. And, um, but one way is that there does come a time when, when I have written it uh, over and over and trying to, trying to tell the truth just right. And there is a time when all of a sudden a work of art, it looks like a work of art. It's, it's beautiful. And then, then it's time to publish. Also, um, I have a reputation with the publishers that I won't hand over the manuscript. <laughs> and that they, they, they even delivered me a, a modern electric typewriter. Uh, they came to the door. Uh, it's, it's, and, and it's like I won't let go of the manuscript. Because there's, I keep thinking, that I, I haven't done it. I, I, this isn't good. I, I, I shouldn't be revealing these things. And, um, oh, one way I have uh, I have solved this struggle of uh, of writing about things that I shouldn't be writing about. Uh, uh, my latest idea is that I show it to the person I'm writing about, and. Uh, and I just, and I tell them to let me know uh, if, if, if they don't like it, uh, tell me. If they want to change anything, tell me. If they want to delete or add, uh, just let me know. And um, so uh, w w how I see it is that I have, I have made a new uh, ethic for a writer. Uh, and uh, so I've shown, I've been showing my work to people and, um, and most people uh, say it's okay. Uh, <laughs> well, you were, you were saying that when your mother read The Woman Warrior, she said, you know, you were concerned about showing her The Woman Warrior, and then she said, you know, how did you know this is, this is so accurate? Yes, my mother, well, you, you know, you who have read The Woman Warrior, you know how angry that book is. And uh, the narrator, sort of me, is angry. And, and that uh, emotion uh, goes through most of the book. And, uh, and I was really nervous when the Chinese translated into Chinese so my mother could read it. And, uh, but what she said was, years, she said, you're so accurate. How could you know? You, and I thought, wow, accurate, isn't that mean truth, uh, and so I was, I was really uh, happy about that. But then she read China Men, and she said, I don't swear. <laughs> you, you made me swear in that book, I don't do that. Well, that's, well, that's not true. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, I, I agree The Woman Warrior is an angry book, but I actually think of it as a disobedient book. And, and, and I mean that as a compliment. I mean, we were talking about this in, in class last week. The, the first line, the first sentence in that book is, you must tell no one. 
my mother said. And then the whole book is the narrator telling everything, right? Yes. So there's something really, in, I think there's, I would love to talk a bit about this. There's something really interesting about the way that the book is both, you know, is, is staking out its own territory and saying, no, I'm not going to keep the silence, um, but is then kind of using that to invent story or to reinterpret story. Like, you know, in No Name Woman, the story of the aunt um, who, is, who, do, who kills herself, the, that story, the narrator retells that story several times, and each time she tells it, she empowers the ant further and further and further until the ant becomes a kind of a powerful figure. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the kind of impulse to disobedience that um, is in, in your yes. writing and in nonfiction writing in general. Yes. Yeah, I, I felt that uh, for me, writing itself seems to be uh, a, a Disobedient, revolution, rebellious. Uh, I, uh, I somehow rebellion is uh, a great energy for me. Uh, so I could uh, write differently from other people. Uh, and uh, and so my mother says, uh, "Don't tell." Of course then I have to tell. I just <laughs> feel it. I must. And, uh, and, and, and it, so I started thinking like a lawyer. So don't tell anyone what I have said to you. Well, she said it in Chinese, and I wrote it in English. <laughs> <laughs> But then she read it in Chinese. <laughs> oh, then she, oh, but that what was really good is that uh, my language is ex very experimental, and I'm using, and when I write Chinese, it's it, in our minor dialect, and um, and and my form is also very odd, and so when the Chinese translated it, uh, they just sort of used a ready-made form, and, uh, and I think the book came across like a soap opera, and not as angry as it is in English. And that's why my mother th liked it. <laughs> Do you think that has to, I mean, you've talked about in the past about how Chinese doesn't have a past tense, right? And mm -hmm. so that there's a kind of presence in Chinese language that isn't, doesn't, that English doesn't inhabit because of, um, and, and I'm curious about the sort of the construction of language and how different languages kind of encourage a different kind of, of storytelling. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your sense of, of language and tense and, mm -hmm. and presence. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of course, I'm very influenced by uh, spoken Chinese and written, and the written, uh, the calligraphy is, it, it is pictorial. And so the, uh, the, the language is very visual, lots of images, metaphors are right there with every word. Uh, it's spoken Chinese is very powerful in that um, the uh, each word just has one syllable, and uh, uh, and here's English uh, with you know multisyllabic words, and uh, so when I'm writing in uh, English, I. Um, I often uh, choose a word with a Celtic r root, uh, old that old English, rather than um, uh, rather than Roman or Greek roots, and 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 it just really uh, surprises me when when I can when an English word and a uh, Chinese word kind of go together. Um, uh, also, I was um, with that Chinese tonal language. Of, so I was trying to get the rhythm of that in, into my English uh, 
uh, uh, writing, and and I th I think it works because um, I uh, there there were some uh, Cantonese uh, scholars who said that they could read from my English that that I had this Cantonese dialect and, and they did a different translation uh, uh, from, from, uh, from the one that was done in standard Chinese. So yeah, I, there's a lot of uh, play with the language mm -hmm. and, um, and well, an example is uh, a fa, a fa Mulan. So now everybody pronounces it Mulan because of Disney. So everybody knows how to pronounce that. Um, but we called her Fa Muklan. I mean, in in my dialect. And uh, so when I was writing. Uh, the, before Disney, uh, I uh, I knew that that most people would say Mulan, and so I put Fa at the beginning because that's what that's what most people I knew said. But m instead of Muk, I put Mu because. That's what most people know. And I, I did feel that I wasn't doing a good job and I was compromising. And, uh, but then uh, a few years ago, I, I retranslated the chant of Fa Mulan. And this time I said Muk, Fa Muklan. And uh, this came at the same time that everybody in Oakland were, were uh, worried about Ebonics. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna do Ebonics too. <laughs> it's interesting because I think, you know, when The Woman Warrior came out in 1976, it was sort of before the era of the contemporary memoir. Um, and the book, I mean, because Fa Mulan is a, is a character, the book is constantly playing with mythology and um, legend as well as sort of autobiographical material, it makes the autobiographical material feel legendary in a certain sense, and the legendary material feel autobiographical. And I'm wondering, when you were starting to write that book, or when you were thinking about that book, was that part of the conception? How did that develop? Because to me, that's one of the most striking, the, the, the chapter, the, the Mulan chapter, is one of the most striking chapters because it is, it feels entirely autobiographical, and yet it's also um, otherworldly, right? So I'm curious about kind of the, the, the relationship of those two things and how they evolved because it runs throughout your body of work. You know, one reason it fe felt autobiographical to you is because at, at some points, instead of calling Fa Mulan she, I would say I. Exactly. And but what happened was, I was writing about myself, and I was, and, and not about other, like mythical creatures or anything. It, the the uh, first, maybe the first five, ten drafts, uh, it was, uh, Famulan did not appear, and um, it, it it, it was my daily life, you know, my relationship with my mother, my teachers, my friends, and uh, and the way I see it is that the first draft is you're, you're laying the footprint of your building, and the second draft is the next story, and the third draft, and you go higher and higher, and then. And, and as you do each draft, you know more. You, you, you understand more. And, and more information is coming in also. And then when I got to about the 12th draft, somehow I got, wait a minute, what, what power is, is inspiring this? 
this, there's this feminist uh, s story, and then, wow, what about when I was a little girl, my mother would chant Fa Mulan, and I would follow her around chanting it, and, and I could see from that perspective, when I get to the 12th story up here, my perspective changes. I see more history, I see deeper myth. And so I wrote the Famulan section last, and then I embedded it into uh, uh, the, the middle of the book. I want to ask you about um Often communities, whether they're families or cultures or whatever, um, resist someone writing from within it. I'm thinking partly about, um, you know, Frank Chin and some of the mm -hmm. reaction to to um, to to Woman Warrior and, and China Chinamen. But I'm also thinking about writers, or, or I'm thinking about you in terms of, of Chinese culture. I'm thinking about writers like Philip Roth in terms of writing about Jewish culture from the inside, or Jhumpa Lahiri, who we were talking about, or, or Viet uh, Nguyen writing about Vietnamese culture. You know, in terms of that sense, was there ever a, a concern for you or a sense for you that the community felt you were somehow betraying it by revealing the secrets to, the outside, to outsiders in, in, in the work, in the, way, in the way that those other writers have been criticized from within their communities. Yeah, th there has been uh, that, and also people saying, why don't you ever talk about the good, happy stories that we have? <laughs> you know, all this tragedy, and, uh, uh, but you know, that really, uh, doesn't concern me anymore, but mm -hmm. you know what does? Uh, I, um, I I know a writer who uh, has written a beautiful book uh, uh, from the point of view of a Palestinian girl, and uh, she uh, she joins a circus troop, and the circus troop is made up of, of uh, Israeli and Palestinian uh, girls, and uh, there really is such a troop. And um, the, the writer is a 70-year-old uh, uh, American man, and uh, the, uh, and he uh, won a prize for, for one of the stories that are in this novel, and nobody will publish it, and they admit that this is appropriation, that we can't have this white man doing this with the Israelis and the Palestinians. And uh, so, uh, We've all been working on this, trying to get people to support it. I'm not going to say his name because uh, we, so we're still trying. And, uh, and so that, that is a problem that's happening in mm -hmm. publishing right now. Um, in fact, I had a, 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 some students uh, in class, uh, one was black and one was Jewish, and uh, one of them accusing the other one of of taking, stealing their stories, and one of them crying, and I, as the uh, elder and as a teacher, gave them license to write about anybody you please. I think you just have to do the, you have to do the work to uh, inhabit the you know inhabit the story and inhabit the character right I mean if if you're doing the work then that's what's necessary I want to ask you though I mean you know in the reading the first reading the diary reading and also throughout your work there's a political component um, you know your own using writing as activism all your you know the work that you've done over the last 
30 or so years with veterans, uh, beginning with Vietnam veterans, but also sort of veterans across the wars. You're talking about, um, you know, expanding um, one, of the, the, one of those anthologies now to include um, new essays dealing with current situations. Can you talk a bit about the kind of relationship of politics or activism to writing? I mean, I think that it's a, it's a fundamental aspect of, of making art, the, that political statement, but I'm curious, um, from your sense as a practitioner, how does that, um, how do those two things coincide? Mm. Well, I, you know, I, uh, I, I don't think of them as being separate, yeah. uh, and uh, it seems that uh, to to make your work public is already political. To, uh, to just you know, when I uh, first started publishing. I did not want to write politically because I thought it was like propaganda, and I didn't want to write pro propaganda. Uh, the uh, uh, um, and then uh, as far as looking at politics, um, I, I I also feel that it's that I want to be able to write from the point of view of the people I disagree with mm -hmm. and make them and, and understand them and and, uh, and put their ideas uh, I mean uh, put them out there it, it seems like if you can write the point of view of anybody then they are already sympathetic. I guess I thought about that writing China Men, because here I'm, I'm a feminist. Okay, so that first book is, I've heard it called the Bible of Feminism, <laughs> and and the next thing I want to do is write a book about men, and uh, and I thought it it, it takes empathy and compassion and empathy in the sense of just having my spirit enter their spirit and and know how they live and uh, uh, so that the, I, I felt that was a, a, a feat for me and uh, and it, it, it's it's a, a pol it's political too in the sense of understanding and being with the other. Empathy is political, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's that famous story, or I guess famous, I don't know how famous it is, but um, where that, you know, when you turned in the draft of Chinaman, your editor, who was a man, said, it's not, you don't, the men aren't sad enough. <laughs> oh, yes. And, you know, and then you went back and wrote a scene and said, is this sad enough, right? Yes. Um, you know, and I, do, I think there's something really powerful about that. I think that's so much that question of sadness, which we never really talk about in terms of everybody, is such a, I mean, it, it, it's such a prime motivation in some way. It's, it's the source of so, of so much trouble, I think. And so there's something really powerful about the sadness there. But what's also interesting to me about those, two, those first two books about uh, Woman Warrior and Chinaman is how you go back and retell stories from the woman warrior that were told from the women's point of view. You retell those stories from the man's point of view in, in, in Chinaman. And it's a, it's a profound imaginative leap that you're making. And I wonder if you can talk about the, the, both the impetus but also how, how, uh, how it was achieved, how you, you know, what you sort of had to do to get inside that mindset. Yeah, you know, I am able sometimes when I'm sort of half awake and half asleep or, or, uh, or I, I'm, I'm very alert, but there's also some state where I, I can go somewhere else and... Uh, Sometimes I am able to enter another person and um, 
Yeah, that, that, that's, you know, I, I can do that. <laughs> it's the imaginative. So watch it. <laughs> right. So I want to... Maybe, uh, maybe it is imagination, but, but it just... But it... But I do have an imagination that that, that feels like something else. Mm -hmm. that, that feels almost like uh, making a painting or something. But this one, it feels like, uh, I don't know, voodoo. <laughs> so I want to ask you, so at the end, towards the end of, of um, I Love a Broad Margin to My Life, you write, I'm just going to, I'm going to do the terrible thing of quoting you to yourself, I apologize. <laughs> you write, as far back as I can remember, I wanted to write. Before I had language, before I had stories, I wanted to write. That desire is going away. I've said what I have to say. I'll stop and look at things I see from the corner of my eye, become reader of the world, no more writer of it. And I know that you know, you've moved increasingly in a direction of, of private writing. You know, there was that profile in the New Yorker a few years ago where um, you talked about a project you're working on that you're calling Maxine Posthumously. That yes, is, is, yes. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the difference, and this kind of goes back to the public-private writing question, but really the impulse to write as opposed to the impulse or the necessity of publishing. Uh, in my mind, it's the difference between um, writing and living. And living. Yeah, yeah. because what's been happening is as I grow older and as I have grandchildren, I don't want to write. I don't want to write. I want to play with the kids. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and then I, I also know that throughout my life I've been writing and, and talking story ever since I ever since the last couple of incarnations and uh, and I keep thinking you know I there's parties that I don't go to there's uh, there, there's there's getting locking my son up in another room so I could have you know I gave him candy and locked him up and so I can write and uh, there there's there's movies I won't go to uh, the, there's vacations, don't get vacations, and it's all sacrifice for the writing. And in the last few years, I keep saying I'm retiring now. Okay, no more, no more, but, but it keeps coming. And uh, so, um, so, when I uh, said that, uh, that uh, I'm saying there, I'm retiring. I'm going to live now. Right. I'm I'm going to listen to music now. Uh, before I would turn it off because it interfered with, with what's going on in my head. Yep. And um, so I keep announcing that I'm I'm going to quit. It, but. It won't let me go. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's harsh that way. <laughs> yes. So let me, um, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we'll turn it over to, to questions from the audience. The thing that I, you know, of all the many things I prize about your writing, the thing that I prize most about it is its knowing conditionality, like the idea that, you know, your, your willingness to doubt your own authority, your willingness to question the story you're telling. You're telling one version of a story, someone else is going to have a different version. As we were just talking about, sometimes that's built into the books um, where you're retelling stories in different ways. Um, to me, that sort of willingness to cede authority is actually what gives you authority. And, um, and the same with form and, and genre, because you're moving, you know, you've written fiction, you're fictionalizing in your nonfiction. In mar broad margin, you're essentially writing a memoir as a long poem. I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about the I don't know what I would call it, the swirl of, of form, of content, of story, um, of conditionality that you're working with and how you build towards that kind of authority that the work has and that the work presents to readers. I, I, um, uh, you talk as if I have control over this. No, I know you don't have control. <laughs> I talk as, as a reader, it comes across as if you have control. I'm just wondering what, you know, in terms of sort of what's, 
I guess the translation of the, the pieces you're working with, the fragments you're working with, whether structural or formal pieces or memory pieces, into um, a work that coheres. And it, I think maybe it goes back to that sense of foundation, the drafts being foundations. But I'm just very interested in the kind of the authority of giving up authority or acknowledging that you don't have authority. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the, uh, the acknowledging that I don't have authority is that uh, it, it seems as if things just come to me. And... Uh, and I, I have to be willing to uh, receive them and, and just be empty. And whatever comes, comes. And uh, it surprises me when, um, uh, when, when uh, a, a feeling or a memory uh, or uh, it, it arrives, and I, I think first it arrives as a, a, a vision, um, and it's and then and then I, I start to find the words for it, the and. And it, it sometimes, uh, if it's uh, so it, 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 uh, I, if if it's uh, like an argument or a a, uh, a a something that's reason reasoned out, then it becomes an essay, and sometimes. If it's, uh, uh, it's, it's it's just a moment, and and it doesn't lead anywhere, then it could be a, a, a haiku of that moment, um, and, uh, and 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 sometimes there's a uh, a, a, a rhythm. Uh, uh, it, it felt like I was hearing a symphony when uh, China Men came to me, and and I could hear the the the, the different waves of of of, uh, of sound. Uh, it 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 just um, in some ways I think oh. Well, one could say these are gifts that are given from the muse. Um, but then, when I think that way, I, um, I, I, I don't... I, I, I'd like to uh, feel that all we have to do is work hard and something will come. And, and don't just sit around and and wait for inspiration, uh, but um, especially when I'm teaching school, when I'm teaching writing students, I I don't want them to just sit around doing nothing and waiting for the muse, and so I tell them that. Everybody's got a story. All you have to do is work and write a little bit every day, and you're going to be fine. So th that's what I teach in class. And so don't tell them about all this. Oh, some of you are students. So, <laughs> so what I do is just, I, I, I don't think, I don't know whether I answered you at no, all. No, you're doing great. So basically, though, because I think this is, is interesting, it's, it's writing grows out of listening then. I mean, it becomes, oh, it's an art of listening, right? Yes. I mean, we don't think of it that way. We think of it as an art of telling, but it's really an art of listening. Yes, you're right. And being open. Um, when talk about listening, um, when I lead the veterans writing group, um, we evoke Avalokiteshvara. She is the bodhisattva of compassionate listening. And the, the idea is that 
all we do if we listen to other people, uh, it makes them feel good. Uh, it makes, it heals their wounds. Uh, also, they tell you really good stories. So, yes, I, I think listening is a talent of... Uh, yeah, and an, an increasingly difficult talent in a, a world full of noise. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you so um, much. We, We, uh, we, we, uh, we, can, we will open it to questions from the audience. There are, I don't see the microphones, but there should be microphones being set up. Um, we'll bring the lights up a little bit. Um, so if, you wanna, if anyone has questions, please come up to the front here. Um, there'll be microphones. You can line up. We've got about 15 or 20 minutes for audience Q&A, so don't be shy. Um, yeah, go ahead. To preface my question by saying I'm really grateful to have been able to hear you speak today. Um, uh, towards the beginning of your conversation, you talked about if you feel unsure about if it's okay to write about someone, you show them what you wrote about them. I'm wondering if you have any guidance or advice when writing about people who have already passed, considering that you can't show them what you're writing oh, about. Oh, oh, yes. No, the, this is advice on writing about anybody, whether they have passed or not. Uh, you know, the story form is is very good for for all kinds of things. Look at the form of story. First, you you take conflicts. You you take. Uh, enemies, and you put them together, and uh, you you take the worst problems you can think of, and you put it in that story. Uh, you put those people in the story, and um, and they have their conflict, and if you keep writing to the end of the story, there will be you will have deeper understanding, and there will be a reconciliation at the end. And, uh, and then, at that point, um, you can show the, a person a story, and they will feel understood. And, th and so that way, um, it is, it, it, it's a good way of writing and it's a good way to relate to the other person. Okay, now you're talking about uh, a person who's gone and we have all grown up with that saying, don't speak ill of the dead. And then you think, oh, Okay, so what, how, am I just supposed to say nice things to, about this person? Um, I have written about dead people, and I felt that their death is a liberation for me to write anything I want about them, <laughs> because <laughs> cause they're not around to read it anymore. And... And this writing is just for you, so that you can, um, so that you can uh, get straight with an understanding of of this person who's gone, who was important to your life. All you writing students out there, that's a key point. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Professor Hong Kingston. Thank you so much for your presence. Um, uh, my name is Soyi. Um, I, I, had a, I wanted to ask you, um, I want to set up this question very briefly by saying that one of the stories in The Woman Warrior, which has haunted me for probably a decade now, is the, um, a song for a barbarian reed pipe um, in which you write about 
the, t the or, sorry, the narrator um, tells mm -hmm. a story of, of, of her tongue getting snipped and, and also of this relationship, that, the friendship that she has with this, with this, um, this other Chinese American girl um, and who she wants very much to make speak. And you have this incredible line, um, I looked into her face so I could hate it up close. And I think, of, <laughs> and I think about that line so often. It's a, it's a story that I have written to and written about and written from a place of. My question for you is about Asian American f women's friendships. Um, and I mean, I, I guess I'm curious about your relationship to, or, or your, the way that you have thought about Asian American women's friendships and the difficulties of maybe the ways in which you render them into writing, how you channel the spirit of doing so. So I find so often that for myself it's, and as, this, as the story captures so deftly, it's like we, it's very hard to speak to each other. It's hard to make ourselves talk to each other and make, uh, make each other speak to us if that makes sense. Um, I, I wonder if I can get your guidance. <laughs> well, that story was about me as a 12-year-old. And, uh, the, uh, and, the, and now I am 83 years old. And things have changed. <laughs> and so when I was uh, 12 years old, it was, uh, so I was a bully when I was 12 years old. <laughs> uh, and, and I bullied her. And I, I, I think this is what's different uh, from my work, from other people's work. Everybody else writes about being bullied, and I'm the <laughs> I admit that I was the bully, and um, oh, I used to kick boys too, because I thought that boys didn't have pain. <laughs> I, I just, because you never the see sadness. them cry. <laughs> boys don't get sad, only girls cry and get sad. So I experimented and I went around kicking them. <laughs> so anyway, so, okay, that was a friendship of, uh, of 12 year olds. And at that time, um, we didn't want to look like an Asian girl. We wanted, I wanted red hair and blue eyes so badly. And, and so of course I pick on this girl who looks just like me. I don't want, I don't want her to be feminine and, and uh, geisha girl and, and and so, but now at the age of 83, none of that happens anymore. My very best friends are Asian and, and, we, and we understand a lot of things and speak to each other in similar languages. Does that? answer your question? Yeah, so some of my best friends are Chinese American girls, but some of the people who have hurt me the most are also Asian American women, you know? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, they're called frenemies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening, I was just wondering who you're reading right now that's exciting for you. Oh, I'm reading right now. Somebody gave me this book and she said, you will love it. And uh, it, it's called, um, it's called, oh my gosh. I told you. And I can't remember either. <laughs> oh God. I'm terrible with titles. I'm, I'm, I'm terrible, terrible with titles. With titles. I'm terrible with and titles. And I'm terrible at authors. Her name is Alba de Sapedis. It's, it's something like the forgotten notebook, the hidden notebook. The hidden, yeah, I think the... The hidden notebook. It's something like that. It's, it's not popular, but it's, it's really good. It's, it's translated from the Italian. And, uh, and it's, it's about somebody who's keeping a secret diary. And, <laughs> and she's trying to hide it. And she puts all her secrets about 
her family and maybe lovers. She's putting it all in the diary and she's hiding it. And, and I love this book because it has to do with public writing and secret writing. And I think you'll like it too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, um, hi, Professor. Thank you for this amazing event. Um, my name is Alice. I'm an international student from Beijing. Um, so I noticed that there, are, like, some of your works were like impacted by some like they, they were what I didn't get. Oh, sorry. Uh, some of your works were impacted by um, Chinese literary works, like for instance the um, Trip Master Monkey. I think it's impacted by um, Journey to the West, Xiuji. So I'm wondering if there's a Chinese writer that you believed had like certain impacts on your writing. Um, and also, um, so when you were talking about the, your experience with different Chinese dialects, um, I'm thinking of, would you give any advice to like students that are bilingual and like could write in different um, languages? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. oh, oh, the, uh, I am very influenced by the, oral storytelling, because uh, my father would sing uh, the poems, and, uh, and my mother would, she would tell these great classics like uh, the, the, the monkey stories uh, or, or, or the three kingdoms. I mean, these long epics, and night after night, she would tell more. So. Uh, and she told me Robinson Crusoe, which I thought was a Chinese story, <laughs> and and so it's um, so so I have been influenced uh, by that, but but in an oral way, and uh, and and when you hear a story instead of reading it. It, it, it does influence the, the, the rhythms, and also oral storytelling changes from, from uh, time to time, and uh, with each telling, uh, depending on what, what, what's going on, the story will be different. And, uh, and so all of that influences me. Um, and, and uh, I th feel that people who are bilingual, trilingual, they are so, you, you are so uh, wealthy because there's so much to draw on. And, uh, and, and, and there's all kinds of play. I, I noticed that uh, the, the uh, people writing in Spanish, uh, th they will do whole, uh, Pages or or dialogues uh, in um, in Spanish with no uh, with no translation, and uh, and you could do it that way, uh, or you could just pick out one word and and uh, and play on that. Uh, there's just more to work with, and but what I love about having English is that we've got an alphabet, so that so that we can re, we can reproduce the sounds of other languages. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Natalie. I just wanted to say both my sister and I love your work, and although my sister can't be here right now, she wanted me to ask. Um, how have folkloric traditions shaped your writing? How say that again? How have folkloric traditions? Oh, shaped folklore! Your oh my goodness! It it uh, it it shapes my writing and my psyche very much. As as I said to Alice, the, um, the, the I I receive folklore as bedtime stories, so of course. 
they weave into my dreams. And so my dreams and the stories, and they all go together. They also uh, form my ethics, too. It was very important that uh, the Buddha uh, jumped into the fire as a rabbit and so to feed the hungry person. Okay, so that's part of my ethics. We've got to do that. Oh, this is the year of the rabbit. So don't forget, you could jump into the fire and you could feed everybody. Okay. So, okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Sydney, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I did want to mention, I first read your book, The Woman Warrior, with my class in high school last year, and I was ecstatic to return to it this year in an Asian American Studies course, where we're really studying the foundational works of Asian American women, and your writing being a prime example of that. Um, I would love to know, as an aspiring writer myself, um, how did you or what part of your writing process or your lived experiences enabled or empowered you to write these stories that were indicative not only of the transformative nature of Asian American women's stories, but of the Asian American experience in general to tell these vastly and nuanced stories about our community and just maybe what experience helped you or empowered you to write these stories? I wonder, I don't know whether there were specific experiences because I, I have thought about this myself and what I, I have always felt the urge, and I mean from a baby, I felt the urge to, to express myself in words and um, it was, and I had that urge before I had anything, uh, what, I had no stories in mind, I had no causes in mind. I, um, and, and sometimes when I got older, I, I, I just kept having this feeling, but with nothing to write about. And, um, it's so I don't know what I just seem to have been born with that, but then um, then I uh, recognized it as a talent when um, uh, when uh, when good things happened. I thought, you know, just some some wonderful gift I got, or a new friend talked to me, or some boy seemed to like me, and I thought, oh, this is so good. I've got to write it down so I can save it forever. And, um, and, but then what happened was bad stuff would happen, and then I'd say, I'm not going to write it down because if I didn't write it down, it didn't happen. And I don't want to remember it. So I guess the answer would be um, that I, I experience good things. <laughs> All right. We, have, we only, unfortunately, have time for one more question. So, and, and I should say, after this is done, there will uh, be a book signing, and, um, and we'll, you'll, if you, you'll go out and then... Uh, Maxine will be in the Okay, for the people way. who can't do a book, if you can't give your question now, we'll, we'll talk afterwards. Oh, out there, okay? So, yeah, okay. she'll be out there signing. Yeah. So, and you can so ask you, me so later. Please okay. go ahead. My name is Mina Chow. I am a professor of architecture at USC for 20 years, and I'm known for my filmmaking. I have a film on PBS which changed policy last year. I want you to know that you changed my life. Mm -hmm. I graduated Berkeley in 1989. Before I graduated, I was introduced, those are my original copies from Asian American Studies in 1985, fall of 85. 
And I'm doing a story about another woman who graduated Berkeley in 1949, before, before, 40 years before I did. So my question, first of all, I also appreciate your architectural references too. <laughs> And I also appreciate the fact that you said that you can sometimes, in that state of between waking and asleep, you, can, you can enter somebody. Because elements of ancestral ghosts populate a lot of the work that I do. So I am a role model for a lot of Asian American women. And I do the work that I do because of you. And I want you to know I want to know what you think about the fact that sometimes I'm doing this film because something, she, I have this woman named Helen Liu Fong and she's haunting me. And um, I want to know what you think about the fact that things are so, I'm asking a question that when I was in, you were my first role model because in, in the 1980s, there were not that many role models for Chinese American girls. And so you were my first one. And I was basically asking questions about why my grandmother favored my brother over me and my sisters. Why we were not buried, we were not allowed to be buried in China in the cemetery plot, but my father and my brother were. And yet I have these same questions with students that are coming to me. And I'm wondering what you feel like about the fact that how little has changed and how much has changed. Because I think the same questions are going to be continually asked. Maybe as uh, human beings, we, we have to meet the same human problems over and over and over again until we can figure it out. And maybe each one of us has to do it for ourselves each time. Because, you know, I, I would think, okay, we solve this. We, we have the Civil War, we solve slavery. And it was so, it, it was such a horrible time. But we did it, and now we find there's still there's still slavery, and and so that's just one example. I mean, it, the uh, oh uh, countries coming to g together, such as these states, these United States, they were each separate little countries, and and putting them together. And, and it keeps falling apart. And other countries are doing the same thing. And it, it's, uh, you, you're, you, you, so we have those problems and, and the students are still coming to you with the same thing. And, and, but we do, I, I think uh, as an older person, I feel that I have solved some of them or come to terms with them myself. And, uh, and I, I know what actions that I can take that, that makes me uh, feel better and maybe makes the world a little bit better. So I think we just keep passing it on. Uh, and, you know, as a, as a teacher, I know that, you know, I have to go in there with a lot of faith that I can teach anybody anything and, uh, or I can help somebody's life be better. And, and sometimes I have doubts. And so I just keep working it out. <laughs> All right. Thank I'm, you. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine Hunt Kingston. Thank you all for being here. Um, <laughs> and if you'll if you'll all file out, we'll come back out and we'll um, we'll do the signing. But we'll sign thank books. you all for being here.